Thanks for joining us, Curtis. Thank you. Um, before I introduce Curtis properly, just a couple of things. Uh, it would be great to get your questions during the conversation if you, if you want to throw something into the mix. Um, if you actually just use your mouse to have a look down the bottom of your screen, you'll see there's a little Q&A icon. Um, if you just type in your question at any stage there and then I'll, I will see it. Um, and if I can throw it into the conversation, I will. Otherwise, I'll hold off until the end and then I can pose a few questions to Curtis. Um, at the end of the conversation. But absolutely great to have you all with us. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to Jane Seaton from Beaufort, Bo Beaufort Street Books for organising the event and for all of the bookstores around the country who have promoted this opportunity that we have to talk to Curtis Sittenfeld. Um, it's absolutely great to have you all with us. And I just want to remind people that um, when you go out to buy your copy of Rodden, go to your local bookstore and buy it. That's what we're trying to achieve, is to get people to head into their local bookstores um, and support them during this particularly strange time. Curtis, I'm going to spend a minute introducing you properly before we start this conversation. Um, as a first-time novelist, Curtis Sittenfeld had a dream run with her book Prep in 2005, and by that I mean that it was a New York Times bestseller. And then she's backed up that success uh, with five other novels and a short story collection. Uh, the, the novels include a book called American Wife, which is largely considered to be her breakthrough novel, modelled on the life of Laura Bush, the wife of US President George W. Bush, and Eligible, in which Curtis was invited to write a modern day version of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. And last week, the much anticipated release of the novel Rodham, uh, which was launched into the world last Tuesday. The novel asked the very big question, what if Hillary hadn't married Bill? And it's my pleasure to be talking to you tonight, Curtis. Thank you so much, Mary. Now, um, one of my uh, ways of preparing is that I just stalk you. Like, I just stalk everything that's <laughs> ever, ever, that you've ever put online. And so because I started researching for this podcast, like, uh, for this conversation rather, before you started doing um, publicity for Rodden, I was listening to things that you'd done way back. And one of the things that I listened to was your brother PG Sittenfeld's second episode of his podcast, <laughs> in which he's in conversation with you. And in that conversation, he's talking, you and he are talking about the, um, the essay that you had written for Esquire um, called uh, The Nominee, uh, and you were talking about its potential as a novel. So that would have been like, maybe that conversation was about 2016 or maybe slightly later than that. Um, and here we are, like here is the novel. It's, it's, it's a reality. It's so funny. Well, I confess, I have no idea what either of us said. So what did we say? Did we say like, it could be a novel or did we yeah. say it would never be a novel? You were pretty much, he was, he pitched the idea to you. In huh. fact, you were like, oh yeah. And then he was kind of excited about it and saying, well, I, I want to kind of participate in this in some way, you know, can I, can I, can I, which he did, didn't he? I mean, he's yeah. really readers. That's so, it's so funny. Um, the internet is terrifying. Congratulations on your very thorough research, but the, <laughs> the internet is, is completely terrifying. Um, yeah, so my brother, um, I grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio, in, in the American Midwest, and I'm one of four siblings. My brother is nine years younger than I am, and he is um, a member of Cincinnati's city council. So he's been elected, you know, three times. To, as as one of I it, I should know this I don't know how many members of, of Cincinnati City Council there are but um, I feel like maybe nine anyway um, he, to sort of uh, you know oversee city business and work with the mayor and and so I could turn to him because he knows from the inside what an election looks like and so I could I, I very often you know texted him questions that were like you know, if someone's announcing a campaign, like where physically, I mean, I, I knew some places, that's, that's actually probably an answerable question, but like, um, you know, what's the earliest staff members that they assemble or things like that. So it's, it's funny that <laughs> I'm sure if you, if, if I go back and tell him this now, you know, he might feel like he deserves like a co-credit on the front of the book. <laughs> but someone listened to my second episode. <laughs> 
Um, I, when you actually started to take on this task, finally, after, I guess, toying with this idea for a while and then seeing that it did actually have legs, um, how did you decide that, that Hillary not marrying Bill was the big question, as opposed to maybe Hillary leaving Bill or some other big kind of turning point being the thing that happened in this story? So, um, you know, obviously you mentioned, I had written this short story for Esquire and it, the premise which an editor um, named Tyler Cabot reached out to me and this was his idea, this was not my idea, but he said, um, you know, what if you wrote a story from Hillary's perspective as she's accepting the Democratic presidential nomination? And, and this is, you know, I think this was about eight months before the American presidential election in 2016. And because I had written American Wife, which is a fictionalized you know, version of Laura Bush's life story, I sometimes was invited to write essays. And I would decline to write essays about Hillary Clinton because I felt like almost anything that could be said from a non-fictional perspective had been said, or even if it hadn't been said, I was not the person who could like you know, pull fresh insights out of the, the topic. Um, but when I wrote this short story, because it was fiction, and it was in, I mean, I, they sort of said, do you want to do this idea? And then once I said, okay, they didn't really put restrictions or, or anything on me. Like, I guess I could have done it in a few different ways, but I wrote it from the first person. So, you know, like, I am, you know, talking to a journalist and blah, 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 or like, I, I am walking down the street in my pantsuit. Hopefully I would never write a sentence like <laughs> um, But anyway, but it was a very interesting experience because instead of the question, which underlies certainly a lot of, you know, articles and essays in the United States, which is um, what do the American people think of Hillary Clinton? By writing this story, the question became, what does Hillary Clinton think of the American people? And it, I felt like I had a ton to say, and it was it was really interesting, and it was just sort of you know altering the perspective. And so, so that that was one thing that I think kind of maybe put me on the path to writing the book. Although, if the 2016 election had turned out differently, if she had been elected, I don't think I would have written this book. Like I think in some ways. I was, um, you know, just <laughs> trying to like calm myself down because I was incredibly upset and still am after the election. Um, but th another thing that that I realized was school children, American school children who knew that Hillary was running for president, in many cases, literally didn't know that Bill Clinton existed. And that really intrigued me because I thought, you know, if adults also didn't see them as interconnected, would the outcome of the election have been different? And then to, to answer the question you actually asked, um, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's public information that she turned down his first two marriage proposals. They both kind of joke about this. Um, and, you know, she says it's the biggest decision she ever made, that she, you know, she feels like she made the right decision, she would do it again, which I use as an epigraph in the book. Like, I, I, I decided to let her have her say before I had my say for 400 pages. Um, but it, it seemed like it wasn't that implausible that they hadn't gotten married. I mean, they're seen as such a sort of defining couple of the last 30 years in politics and American culture. But if you go back to the beginning, I mean, it's, it is kind of fascinating. And I, I, to, we can get into this more if you want to, but I'm not even sure she ever said no to his proposals because she, she didn't want to marry him as much as maybe she felt like the timing or the geography wasn't quite right. But it's such a, that's such a tantalizing tidbit for a novelist that like, how, how did no one else write a novel about this until now? You know, like, I think that's the real question. And I love the fact that in the prologue, you actually um, use her graduation speech 
um, as a way of her kind of coming to the realization of her kind of singularity um, mm. as opposed uh, so I actually yeah so you, um, you set us up for her kind of sense of a singular future in this book in, in you know a fictitious singular future here and um, that was because she seemed uh, how she seemed to others and who she really was she was already aware in 1969 that those two things were two separate entities and it was quite a remarkable way of kind of setting up the book in the sense that she already knew from I guess her first step into really being um, a strong voice for the community that there would always be that chasm between those two things. Mm -hmm. Well I mean so she did it's it's um, you know fact that she she delivered um, you know a speech at her Wellesley graduation um, and just if just out of curiosity, if I say Wellesley, does that have meaning for you? Like no. as a, well, I wasn't sure how to say it exactly, but I but no, but Wellesley, Wellesley. I mean, it may do for some listeners, but not for me. I, what what's the background? so so it, she went to college there, you know. So it's like where she, I guess university, but she um, so she was there, you know, from the ages of. I guess I think she has an October birthday, so I think I think maybe from she, when she was like seventeen to twenty one, um, but it's it's probably the most respected women's college in the United States, and she was um, the leader of the student government, and she was the first student to ever speak at the graduation, and the Massachusetts senator, one of the two Massachusetts senators, gave a speech where she felt like there had been, you know, because it was 1969, there'd been all this political upheaval and, you know, Vietnam and student protests. And she felt that he did not address that in an adequate way. And so she spontaneously, you know, went off script and kind of gave a little rebuttal, which, I, um, you know, I ended up, I have a friend from high school whose mother was in her class um, and and some of her some of their mutual classmates said to me the, the class ended up giving Hillary a standing ovation after the speech and and some parents were really offended and thought she'd been disrespectful to a senator and so there's a line in there which actually does come from one of these you know my friend's mother's classmates um, saying like there were some people like in some families it was sort of a point of contention for years to come that the students had been cheering for Hillary and the parents had felt like this is not appropriate at a at a graduation but anyway she ended up getting national media attention after that speech and so sometimes I feel like people um, you know, think, oh, she would never have been in a position to run for president if she weren't married to Bill Clinton or she would never have become a senator. But actually, she was always considered incredibly talented and promising and ambitious. And it's, it wasn't that he made her that way. No, and, and that's very clearly outlined at the beginning of the book. I just should read you this comment from Beachside Bookshop. Sitting here proudly with a Wellesley 2020 soon to be grad, and I found this prologue especially moving. Thanks for writing, Rodham. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. So, um, so I think this is a great place because that was the prologue. Then let's begin the book by you okay. reading uh, the first few paragraphs. Part one, The Catch. Um, I could just read the entire thing out loud. No. That would be lovely. Okay. I, no one would mind. <laughs> um, the first time I saw him, I thought he looked like a lion. He was six foot two, though I knew then only that he was tall. And in fact, his height seemed even greater because he was big tall, not skinny tall. He had broad shoulders and a large head, and his hair was several inches longer than it would be later which drew attention to its coppery color. His beard was the same shade. I suppose I thought he looked like a handsome lion, but even from a distance, he seemed full of himself in a way that canceled out his handsomeness. He seemed like a person who took up more than his share of oxygen. This sighting took place in Yale Law School's student lounge in the fall of 1970, my second year of law school and his first. 
I was with my friend Nick and Bill was speaking in his loud, husky, southern accented voice to a group of five or six other students. With great enthusiasm, he declared, and not only that, we grow the biggest watermelons in the world. Nick and I looked at each other and began laughing. Who is that? I whispered. Bill Clinton, Nick whispered back. He's from Arkansas and that's all he ever talks about. The next thing Nick told me was actually at Yale Law School, less notable than being from Arkansas. He was a Rhodes Scholar. So, really <laughs> Thank you so very much. Um, I would love to know how sympathetic you were to Bill in writing this book because, um, because of, I guess, your sense of how much he impacted or curtailed Hillary's opportunity in her own life to realize her own talent? Um, so I feel like that's a, that's a complicated question. Um, I think that, um, you know, like I, I think that a person could, um, you know, read about the premise of this book and think that I must detest Bill and, and feel like, oh, you know, he only ever held her back, which is not accurate. Um, I mean, I, I think that it's really hard to assess, you know, how we affect each other's lives. And even, even if I'm a, a fiction writer <laughs> making it up, it's still hard for me to assess. Um, I mean, I do, I do feel like in the long term, I think that his baggage was a lot for her to take on. And I feel like she was made to kind of explain or excuse his behavior in, in ways that I do think were damaging to her career. But um, to sort of go back to the beginning, I mean, I certainly understand why in the early 70s she fell in love with him. And he is, I've never met either of the Clintons, but he is famously magnetic and charismatic. Um, and so I, he, he has written this thousand page memoir. I mean, it came out a long time ago, but called My Life. And I read the first 240 pages up to the point when they get, got married. And I felt like I was falling in love with him while I, you know, like he's just such a funny storyteller and, um, it seems like he remembers everyone he's ever met and has kind of like a, you know, fond, colorful tidbit to share about them. And, um, and I, I mean, I also think to have the attention of a really magnetic person, like very focused on you is, you know, I mean, I don't know if it's ever happened to me, but, but I imagine it would be, it would be very irresistible. Yeah, and that certainly comes across in, in your portrayal in the, in the first, I guess, third of the book where, um, where the romance is occurring and that um, Hillary's really taken with his kindness as well, you know, that's just something that you, you might not get a sense of as an observer of them in real life, but how not only attentive, but actually really genuinely gentle with her he was. Well, I mean, again, I, I do think that one of the many mysteries of life is that I don't, I think it's really hard to ever know what the dynamic is between any couple when they're alone together. Um, and so certainly I, I always feel like in any conversation I have about this book, I should emphasize that it is a novel um, you know, it's, it is sort of speculative or made up on my part. Um, but to me, all the facts suggest that they do have genuine, like, love and respect for each other. And, and again, I mean, it's so easy to kind of mock that or, or like, you know, say, but, but then, but they did this or he did this or, but, but I actually, I do think underneath it all that they have this very powerful connection. And it is really interesting because, I mean, you, you have a disclaimer in the front of the book that outlines very, very clearly that this is fiction and should be read that way. And yet I can understand how someone who wasn't familiar with the story could read this. And because you've inhabited those characters and their voices so well, that they might go away thinking that they had read something that was somewhat accurate. Yeah, I mean, I, I know what you mean. And I feel like I've seen a few movies or like watching the TV show, The Crown. Do you watch the TV show? The I've Crown? watched one episode, yeah. 
Um, I've watched, I think I watched maybe the first two seasons and I'm, I'm planning to watch um, the other ones, but I, I, I sometimes think like, okay, well, I know that this is, you know, 70% historically accurate or 40%. So it feels as if it's all historically accurate. Although interestingly, a lot of people <clears throat> who read the book say, I was compelled to start Googling to see what's true and what's not true. So in a weird way, you know, it, the book might be nudging people to get a firmer grasp on the historical record. Mm. And I mean, I, I heard you say in another interview that it, because you read so widely to, you know, try to get across as much of the literature that has been written about Hillary and by Hillary and by Bill um, for, for research, but also to the point where you actually had a book on your lap from time to time of, you know, tell, tell, I won't tell you that story. You tell me that story. You can tell, you can tell. <laughs> but, well, the funny thing is there, I mean, so much has been written about the Clintons that there's, that actually, even though I feel like I did a significant amount of research, there are, you know, there's, there are actually popular books that I didn't read. Um, in some cases, maybe like I started them and thought like, this is not serving the purpose I need it to serve. And then, or in other cases, it was just like the sheer quantity made it impossible for me to read everything out there about them. Um, but, you know, so I certainly was influenced by her two memoirs, Living History, which I believe first came out in 2003. And then what happened about the 2007, about the 2016 election, which came out in 2017. Again, I, you know, I read the first 25% of his book. I read um, two books that I felt like were really helpful were um, the Carl Bernstein biography of her called A Woman in Charge. And then there's a book by a New York Times reporter named Amy Chozik, and that book is called Chasing Hillary. And Chozik followed her on, off and on for 10 years, including on the 2016 campaign trail. And it's like a riveting look, a very, you know, like on the one hand, she as a reporter felt like she didn't have the access she wanted to Hillary, but it still gives you this really nitty gritty sense of what it's like to be a political reporter, you know, in the present day um, at, the, at the sort of highest levels. Um, so yeah, there were definitely, uh, you know, like I, I had to sort of do this thing where I was weaving fact and fiction together, but there were some scenes that, that are kind of, you know, have a relationship to reality. And I, I, I as much as possible, I wanted, the, it was, it's almost like the details, I didn't feel like they had to be true or real but I wanted them as much as possible to be plausible. Yeah, I, yes, it, and that's exactly what it is. Um, actually, you're gonna be in conversation with Amy Chosey, can't you, about Rodham, is that today? Is that later yeah, on? Yeah, actually, well, to, for you, it's, it's in the morning. I know, right now, of course, it's, it's the morning where I live, but if, if any of you, <laughs> if anyone watching, um, feels like, I, I think that it seems like you're doing a very um, comprehensive job, but if anyone feels like they're left wanting more, yeah. So I, I actually, um, I'm trying to think, I think that, that Amy Tozik and I, you know, followed each other on Twitter. I mean, probably I followed her and then maybe, maybe she politely followed me. Um, but, and then we met, we've met once in New York, we had a drink. Um, and, and yeah, she's, I, I'm actually, it's, it's kind of, it's funny because I we exchanged emails last night and I, I want to say in my follow-up email to her, I want to say like, I actually, I think it'd be super interesting for anyone watching that I feel like I should ask her, like we should reserve like at least 15 minutes for me to ask her questions because so many of the questions that I get asked about Hillary, like I don't pretend that I have, you know, sort of special, like I, I almost feel like I have special insights into fiction. I'm not so sure I have special insights into Hillary, but she herself has so much direct experience and, and you know, has done things like, um, like sort of driven to a lot of the places that Hillary lived. And, you know, we're like, I mean, I've been, I've been in, I think maybe the States where she lived, but like I have, I have not been in a library kind of going through archival Hillary material, which Amy Chozik definitely has. Um, I have to ask you because so many people are posting the same question. They are desperate to know 
if Hillary knows about this book and if so, what she thinks of it? So um, I, to my knowledge, um, you know, she hasn't read it or commented on it or anything. And it's funny because, so I sort of went through this with my 2008 novel, American Wife, where people would say, you know, it's based on Laura Bush. Laura Bush was a librarian. She's a huge reader. Of course, she's going to read it. And the way I felt was, you know, to be the first lady of the United States, which obviously Hillary was not only first lady, but Senator, Secretary of State, you're so, you're the focus of so much attention and scrutiny that I think you have to learn to like tune things out. And especially Hillary. I mean, she's depicted on satirical TV shows. There are like t-shirts and bumper stickers with her face. There are, you know, a million think pieces and essays written about her books, entire books. And so I feel like it's not like for me to write a novel about her is not like if I wrote a novel about my cousin, my cousin would probably read it. <laughs> or if I wrote a novel about my neighbor, my neighbor would probably read it. But like when you, when you are incredibly famous, I just don't think that I, like, I think that, you know, she, she reads the news and I know she does read, you know, fiction too, but but I don't think she will read it. And if I were her, I don't think I would. Like, I think that, that probably some people who've worked for her will read it or some, maybe a friend of hers and might like summarize points, but it's not, the weird thing is I definitely admire her a lot. Um, but I do not feel that I tried to write a novel that would, you know, be pleasing to her or be a love letter to her. And if you're writing a novel about someone and you you don't set out to make it a love letter, then it that it's not a love letter. Do you know what I'm saying? I mean, like like if you if you have some distance on the situation, you could say like, oh, obviously Curtis really likes Hillary, but you know, if I wrote a novel about you, which I I, I don't think I'll do unless you're you know say say some really tantalizing things during this conversation. Unless I ask you. I know <laughs> if you ask very politely, I will, um, you know, but, but it's like, I, you know, sort of went into great detail, like wrote it in the first person and went into great detail and about like, these are your innermost thoughts about your friends or your family members or like, this is what it felt like when you were like kissing somebody. I think you, you that is not the novel that you yourself would probably want to curl up with for pleasure. Yeah, and it might be, as you say, that she would regard that as, what, what I think you're saying is that she would regard this book, Rodham, as uh, uh, something that has been uh, added to the popular culture pile of stuff about Hillary Clinton. Yeah, yeah. And then it's, I mean, maybe it has a more, like, you know, literary or earnest flavor than something you know it's not like they're nutcrackers made in her likeness and it's not you know I think the thing that made someone make a nutcracker which interestingly even a nutcracker can be seen as like very mocking or kind of weirdly admiring <laughs> um but I think the thing that makes a person create a Hillary Clinton themed nutcracker is not it's well, I was gonna say it's not it's not the same thing that makes a person write a Hillary Clinton novel, although it's not completely different. I mean, and and I I mean, I'm I'm a very ambivalent person about like everything. So it's if someone says to me, you know, like how, what are the moral implications of writing a novel or like how could you? I, it's I wish that I could be like, where does that question come from? Or like I have no idea what you're talking about, but it's like, yeah. Of course, I understand why someone could wonder that, but I I feel like, um, you know, that I'm try sincerely trying to think about not what her life is like, but what it could have been like, or what you know what her perspective is, or how how her views were shaped, and that to put yourself in someone else's shoes sincerely and not satirically, I think, is a compassionate act. Mm. Yeah, and, and it certainly reads that way. What do you, do you have a feeling about 
um, what it would mean to you to know what Hillary thinks about this book or are you actually completely comfortable with the idea that you may never know and that will be fine? Um, I think I won't ever know. Um, so, you know, uh, Laura Bush was directly asked maybe only once in an interview or once that I'm aware of. And she said something like, um, you know, I, I haven't read the book. Like I don't need to, because I lived it. And, um, so I've had the experience of, you know, writing a book about a public figure and not hearing from that person. And it, I mean, if, if someone said, Hillary wants to have a conversation with you. Um, you know, I would certainly be very open to that. And I would, I, you know, I, I, like, in, even if she said this book is ridiculous, like I would, I would, I would say like, I can, I can see that point of view. <laughs> I can understand how that's true. Um, so yeah, I think that, that, um, you know, I would be certainly extremely receptive to hearing from her, but it's not, I never have woken up thinking like, is today the day that I'll hear from Hillary? I mean, I, I uh, yeah. And, and, and yeah, yeah. I, I don't, I don't think that, that I probably will. Yeah. So it doesn't preoccupy you. No, it doesn't. Pre I mean, again, I've spent a lot of time thinking about her. So there's ways in which she and her life and you know the way she's been criticized and you know her, what her achievements are and um that sort of preoccupies me but like you know will i get an email from her does not really preoccupy and it's it's also i mean again in in what happened which she wrote in 2017 she wrote it maybe 2016 2017 she says like i would marry bill clinton again so it's, I don't know, like, this is a sincere question. Like, would you, if I wrote a novel where you married someone else, like, I mean, would you want to read it? Yeah, it's, it's maybe for a bit of folly, but yeah, I can see that. And I think it is interesting, you know, after everything that they've been through and now they're, well, they're in their 70s now. Yeah. That, you know, anyone who's been in a long-term relationship knows how they kind of fluctuate and mature and everything that they've been through now, they're probably poss quite possibly in the best space they've ever been in, right? And so why would they, you know, after everything they've been through, really care what outside of their own little bubble, what's going on at all? Yeah, yeah. There's a sort of poignant part in what happened where she basically says something like, like, you know, you, you probably know more about my marriage or more about me, or, you know, like you've actually, you've read my email, <laughs> like, and then, then where, I don't know, it's a very, but again, this, this goes back to the fact that I think that you can know the facts of, or some of the facts of someone else's life or someone else's marriage, but you don't know what happens behind closed doors and, you know, what the dynamic is and what exact words are said, which, which maybe that's what some of what drives me is feeling like, okay, I can't know, but, but I can imagine. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, and that's your role as a fiction writer. Um, I, I do have a question here that goes back to Amy Chosik. Um, she's, Jen says, the, the Chasing Hillary book is brilliant. Did you feel sadness reading it and I, about Hillary's poor relationship with the media? You know, so it's a really interesting book where I feel like Amy Chozik is pretty, I feel like it's a very open book where she talks about sort of the tensions between her and Hillary's media team, which kind of progressively got worse over time, um, especially with like the male members of the media team. And she also, I think Amy Chozik talks about, you know, some of her own self-doubt or things she might do differently. And, um, and I, I, I respect the fact, I think that she opens herself up to criticism that like almost any journalist who covered the 2016 election could be subjected to if they were that open like about you know like it's like they're they're human beings too and there are parts of the book so i felt like as a reader i just found it you know riveting and 
it's just like like the details are so interesting and actually the funny thing is um i listened to the audio version and um amy chose is like an excellent i don't know what i guess the word is mimic like she can she can really do like bill clinton's accent or you know her editor's accent or whatever um so like there were times as a voter like reading it as a voter there were definitely times i felt disturbed like kind of seeing how the sausage gets made and as a reader i i felt like i couldn't turn the pages well i was listening to the audio but i couldn't yeah. listen fast enough so so i had sort of different it, it is it is a kind of ultimately like if you're a hillary supporter which i am um it is a kind of painful book in the end. I mean, like there's there's no no spoiler. Like we all know how 2016 turned out. Yeah. Um, speaking about how things turn out, what and I because I, I don't want to be the one who who gives any of these spoilers away. So what are you what are you able to say about how Hillary's story digresses from the point where she doesn't accept that third marriage proposal? Um. Well, so so the book has basically three sections and the first section which you know i read a little bit from is the early 1970s and then um you know it goes into moving to arkansas where where bill is from and is starting his political career and then it jumps into the summer of 1991 is the second section and Hillary, at that point, I don't, I don't think this is too much of a spoiler. Hillary has become a law professor and is living in Chicago, where she grew up. And then um, things happen, and then it jumps to 2015, and that's the third section. So ultimately, it covers like 40 years. I don't do. I, it is confusing because a part of me feels like you almost can't talk about more than like <laughs> the first few pages without yeah. spoilers. But, but it does. It kind of blends some real historical events and then just you know total fiction yeah and the structure um is is hugely valuable the, the way that you set it up i think it really is a great container for the story and the way that you because because and I, I can imagine trying to mold this into something to start off with must have been an overwhelming prospect i mean i know that you're an experienced fiction writer and i'm just a person wondering about what it would be like but um <laughs> did you, did no, you have i did find it overwhelming i i found it i think that I mean, I consider structure very, very important in writing fiction and just like, you know, which scenes I include and which ones I don't and what order they happen in and, you know, how much you jump over time. And, um, and I think I felt the most structural confusion in, of any book I've written. And I don't even think I was clear on what the structure would be until I was, I'd been working for about two years, <laughs> just kind of, wow. I mean, yeah, like I didn't realize that I didn't know, but I, it was all, like, I, I, at times I felt like I, I almost, I'll just say it, like who cares, but I, I almost hesitate to say this because I wouldn't want somebody to be reading and be like, what, like I can tell this is a little messy, but I think at first it was almost just like I was writing scenes and I didn't understand that I would have like chapter breaks and kind of jump over time so there's seven chapters and i originally conceived of it as three short chapters for like a a tight 120 page book all right <laughs> you know it's like 400 pages but um but yeah like it was sort of thinking about okay we're gonna i'm gonna end here you know there's there's almost if you're writing a novel there's almost an infinite number of scenes you could write but saying to myself okay it's 1975 we're going to wrap up here. Like, I'm not going to follow her when she leaves Arkansas and goes back to Chicago. I'm not going to go with her at, in, and like, see, you know, what her new job is or who her roommate is. Like, I'm just, I'm going to walk away from her for 16 years and then pick back up. But it, it took me a while to know that I was doing that. This Here's a tidbit. This is, I feel like if someone watching this is a writer, this might be interesting. And, and I think everyone else, this will sound like nonsense, but I feel that the book has an um, an H shaped structure, like it's like the letter H, where it's like, um, you know, the first three chapters, 
or take place in the early 70s. And then there's like a bridge across that's the 90s. And then there's three chapters that are in 2015. And of course, you know, having an H shaped structure for um, a book about Hillary was like very pleasing to me and gave me this clarity. But I, it, it's almost like, you know, the reader needs to have, or the writer needs to have ways of like controlling the material. And it, do it, it usually those are imperceptible to the reader and it's probably for the best if they are. Um, I've got a question here from Katrina who asks, was the book in the first person from the outset or did you try different perspectives? Um, the book was definitely in the first person from the outset, which it, it, like in some ways, I think that I can't imagine writing a book, this is kind of a weird thing to say, but about a real person, which again, this is very fictionalized, but and not putting it in the first person because I think it would feel like I was writing a biography. And, and instead I felt like, almost like in the morning, I was like putting on my blonde wig and my pantsuit and like, or um, I don't, do you know the TV show Saturday Night Live? Is yeah. that? So, yeah. And there's the actress, Kate McKinnon, who's like phenomenally talented, who plays or played Hillary Clinton. Um, yeah. And there's an interview she gave where she described sort of, you know, thinking about Hillary from the inside and sort of, you know, cause it's like, she's imitating her gestures and her voice. And, and I, I do think to myself, like, I know exactly what you mean. Like the sentences that she, sort of that Kate McKinnon said to describe her experience of, you know, trying to become Hillary. Like I, I felt like th those, I could have said those sentences about the experience of trying to write from her perspective. Mm -hmm. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about some of the, the revelations that you offer in this book about the kind of person that she was. And, and it kind of lines up with a question here um, that's, uh, in Australia, we heard that Hillary wasn't elected because she wasn't likable. Can you tell, help us understand the American sentiment towards her? Um, in a nutshell. Oh my God. I mean, in some ways, I think that that's what the book is grappling with. And I, I feel, I think that, that when Americans look at Hillary, it's almost like they're seeing different people. Like I almost think there's three, there's three Hillary's that people see them. And so I would say one is, um, you know, people see her as just like incredibly corrupt and has done all this kind of, or maybe there's even four Hillary's that like she's, you know, like incredibly corrupt and has done uh, the sort of accusations of the crimes she's committed are just, like, I would say, I think the succinct way to say it is they do not have a relationship to reality. Then there could be someone who, uh, you know, has more of, and this could be from the left or the right, like they have, that this person is very critical of Hillary. Um, I think that they, they, in my assessment, this is all subjective, like they would say they have a handle on the facts and that they, and you know, what they focus on, like they might say, she was in bed with Wall Street or, you know, she gave these very highly paid speeches for Goldman Sachs. And, um, and then there's like a, th a third category, which is Democrats who vote for her, who would say something like, well, you know, like, I voted for her, but she just wasn't inspiring or she always, you know, sort of rubbed me the wrong way or like I, I wanted to vote for a woman, but not her. And I think in some ways, those are the people that like, I'm not, I mean, I, I'm not running for office at this point. She's not running for office. I'm not really trying to convince anyone of anything, but those are the people that I almost feel like I most could have a conversation with where it's like, like you know when you when you just vaguely don't like hillary why what is, you know is it is it because so much bad stuff has been said about her for so long that like you're only human and so you believed it even if it wasn't mostly grounded in fact um so and then i think there's the fourth category which i feel like this doesn't get talked about enough and maybe like in some ways, one of the pleasures of having this book come out is that I'm interviewed and I get to talk about how much I admire her. Um, 
and how much a huge number of Americans admire her. And often, you know, it's, a, it's disproportionately women and girls. And so sometimes it's like, well, she has all these fans, but it doesn't count. Or like, she's not inspiring. And the subtext is like, well, she's inspiring to women and girls, but not really to men. And so, so, so like, I, I do, I actually think, and even these reflexive words that are used about her, like she's polarizing or she's divisive or something. And on the one hand, I'm not a big fan of either of those words, but even if you were to say she's polarizing, you have to admit that means some people don't like her, but some people really do. And and it's almost like, I think that the unlikability is a self-perpetuating theme or even myth. And and like, if I, you know, if, if, if there was somebody else um, who joined us for this conversation and, and you and I were talking before and, and you said like, you know, this is Beth. A lot of people find her really unlikable. Like it would totally sh shape my set. And I would, I would think like, let me wait and see if she does something unlikable during our conversation. Or, or if I thought she did, I'd be like, oh, well that's that's cause she's kind of unlike, you know, Beth and her unlikability. So it just, I don't know. There's like, I think that maybe we overestimate as humans our ability to come to like independent, thoughtful conclusions about lots of subjects. And I include myself in this. And we underestimate how much we're influenced by like our friends and the media and, and like sort of shorthand ways of talking about things. And um, yeah, and I, I did sometimes think to myself, if somebody like says, oh, Hillary's unlikable, um, you know, like so often I would wonder, could you give a summary of like her career and work experience and when she did what and, you know, what policy she advocated for? And, um, or is it just like, you know, you, you know, some thing that she said about cookies in the early 90s, about like not baking cookies in the early 90s. And, and that's like 40% of what you know about her identity. And it is interesting because I, I was looking at her Facebook page. I think she put up a post for Memorial Day of uh, I, something from years past, obviously, because she was out in a crowd. And uh, uh, the comments that I saw, and there were hundreds, so they would have been horrible ones too, were people saying, I really wish you were president right now. We really need you in the White House right now. Do you think that's a, a, a dominant sentiment or do you think it's just anybody but Trump? Um, I think it's a dominant sentiment. I mean, it, it, it depends. Like, um, I mean, I, I think, I think there's probably both categories. Like there are people who probably think, you know, she w she wouldn't be my number one candidate for president, but she would be better than Trump. And then there are probably people who think like, she's a really intelligent person who, who really does her homework you know, she comes prepared, she's compassionate, she respects scientists, like, of course, she'd be better equipped to handle this specific moment. Yeah, um, I want to go to a couple of the questions from our audience. Um, this is a broad one. Your novels have really captured quintessential experiences in women's lives from the campus to courtship, and then the intensity of life in the peri public, in the very public sphere with American Wife and now Rodden. Are there other elemental women's experiences that you have in mind to write about or is it the woman or their life experience that's intriguing to you? Um, I mean, I think, I think when I decide to write a novel, it's usually because there's some specific idea that like presents itself to me and it just feels like a really big idea that could be approached from many angles. Um, and I mean, I like, I think, you know, women's lives are interesting to me. Like it's not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say like, oh, I'll never write a book from the perspective of a man or, you know, like I, I might if it were the right idea, but I, I do, um, it's funny because some, some people have said things to me like Rodham is a, um, you know, 
feminist revenge story, or even like there's a friend of mine who kind of refers to it as a feminist screed. And, and I feel like there's a time when I, th I think I would have been insulted, but we both understand in the world that we live in that she means it as a total compliment. Like she's sort of like, oh, how is your, your feminist screed? Um, and so, I mean, I do, I think that the biggest driving factor is that I, I write books that I would want to read. And like, I like reading about intelligent, complicated women, often like intelligent, complicated women who make bad decisions or, you know, think that they perceive the world accurately and, and don't, which I wouldn't really say this is rotten, but, um, but like, you know, my recent short story collection, I think that that's a, a lot of the women in there. Um, so, yeah, it's, I don't, I, I think I, I really evaluate stuff on a story by story basis. And I'm, I'm delighted. Like if people, it's, it's really touching to me sometimes when readers say either like, kind of like I've grown up with you and, you know, I read prep when I was in high school and now I'm 30 years old. And, um, or when they say like, you know, I read prep after I gave birth to my daughter in the hospital and then I read you know such and such like when my daughter was having her bat mitzvah and um like it's it's really it's like a huge honor to be part of my readers lives mm. um uh, there's another question here I, I don't know how you're going to go with this one were you motivated to write this book so that there might be a different outcome to having Donald Trump become president I haven't read the book so I don't actually know if that was the outcome in your book that's from Jill um so I think I think I can give an unusually short answer to this question yes <laughs> yes yes and you do a great job of depicting Trump in his cameo appearance in, in the book too. It's, uh, you found his voice magnificently well. It's very enjoyable. <laughs> Thank you. I know it's funny because yeah, he does, he does have a cameo and I did go back and forth. Like there was some question about, he actually had, he had a little more space on the page in an earlier version and both my UK editor and my US editor said like, maybe scale it back a little bit, like, like a, a little goes a long way. <laughs> um, uh, just reinforcing your readers' experiences, prep was shared around our mother's group and reminded us of our youth. Oh. That's from, from one attendee. Thank um, you, thank you. Um, Natasha wants to ask a question about Eligible. Uh, it was such a fun book and I just loved it. Was it fun to write? It certainly reads as if you're enjoying yourself, but I wondered if you were or whether you were ever daunted by the ghost of Jane Austen. <laughs> I would be so flattered to be like, like if the ghost of Jane Austen involved herself in my, in my life or my writing. Um, <laughs> so well, Eligible is this, you know, modern retelling of Pride and Prejudice. Um, it was fun. And actually the part of the reason, I mean, some, again, this, I think this has only happened twice, but I've really run with it. Like two editors approached me with the idea. Um, and part of the reason I accepted was that I thought, like I knew I would be writing toward a happy ending or I'd get to live in the world of Jane Austen while I worked on it. And so I do think it was fun. I mean, I, I feel like one of my responsibilities as a writer is, um, you know, if you're reading my book, I don't want you to be able to tell that like, I really labored over this scene or this scene felt really effortless. Like, I think it should all feel kind of smooth and consistent. And like, I should give you a pleasurable reading experience, or even if it's not, even if it's like an uncomfortable, pleasurable reading experience, like you should feel that I, the writer am in control. Um, and so, so, I mean, I think there were scenes that just like didn't turn out and I revised them seven times, but, but on the whole, it was a fun book to write. It definitely was. Was that, uh, of all of your books, which is the one that's kind of been hacked to pieces most from the from <laughs> first draft to, to its final? Oh, you mean like the most revised? Yeah, or, and actually even having huge chunks of it cut out for, you know, reasons of verbosity or whatever else. <laughs> Didn't work. That's an interesting question. I mean, every book feels different and it's a little bit like, <laughs> like childbirth where like, I think sometimes I don't, and I, I felt this with writing with the publication of Rodham after the publication of American White was 12 years ago. Like I really forgot that a particular kind of scrutiny comes with writing about a public figure. And like, 
really I'd be an idiot not to expect it, but like I, I forgot a little bit because it's been so long. Um, but I think that every novel has its own sort of pleasures and challenges. And, you know, I'm at different life stages and there's different things I know about writing. Like with prep, I feel like I wrote a lot of it out of chronological order in unnecessarily complicated ways, but I had to teach myself to write a novel. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, like I, I haven't tried, but sorry, as the sun rises in Minneapolis, I feel like the lighting is getting all weird. Um, you get, you get to see like, <laughs> it's like my, my makeup might not be up to the chow. It doesn't get really more light. radiant by the moment. <laughs> Impossible. No. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so I think, I do think that, I don't know, there's, or even, um, like, sometimes with a book like Rodham, like, it was kind of, the, when the first part is grounded in history, that provides some, you know, like, guidance or path forward, but then it also provides some restrictions, and so, you know, once we get away from history, and where I'm just, like, making it up, and I'm 44, so, like, as the the, you know, I, I was, I, I was alive for almost all of like the time period that Rodham covers, but, but I was a very young child in the 70s. So it, like, once it goes into the 90s, I remember, you know, the, the certain like Supreme Court confirmation hearings or things like that. So it's like, I'm kind of more comfortable in terms of saying like, this is a word that people did or didn't use in the early 90s. And so there's, again, there's just different things to think about depending on subject depending on structure depending upon like the time period that the fiction is set um just quickly because it is uh we we're up with our hour but do you mind have you got a couple more minutes is that yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um so just two quick things from abby um rodham gets unexpectedly steamy um did you have a lot of fun with those scenes i know i had a lot of fun reading them smiley face and then it says this was one of my favorite books of the year thank you for writing it absolutely remarkable oh thank you thank you so much that's so nice um yeah there, so there are sex scenes in rodham and again i think i think it would be foolish of me not to expect that this would like this element of the book would get some attention but a part of me <laughs> feels like there's been enough conversation about the sex scenes uh, or it comes up in interviews that like someone could think like like you know it's non-stop like in the bedroom and actually it I think there's about four scenes in 400 pages so you can as a reader you can assess I mean you should buy books from your independent bookseller of course um but you should assess whether that ratio like feels really satisfying to you or, um, or not. Um, I mean, I feel like, like I'm someone who, like I love a well-made romantic comedy and to show a couple, like I like reading about and I like writing scenes where two people are falling in love. Like there's just something really elemental and fun and cute and exciting about that. So, I mean, I, I think in some ways, like the sort of, like he put his leg here or whatever, like there's a part of me that, that kind of feels again, amb ambivalence about doing things, even though I think, I think it serves the story to like show like, this is the attraction. This is what it felt like in the moment. Um, but it's probably like, like writing a scene where two characters kiss is probably a, a more purely fun experience than writing a scene where two characters have sex. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I'm really interested in how much your family has supported you around, not your writing career generally, but also as early readers of this book, you put them in the acknowledgements. Um, and, but fundamentally, I'm really interested to know, uh, having brought this book into the world and it's been published for a w week now, how do you actually feel about this book? How does it feel to have it out there? Um, well, those are two very separate questions. So I, again, I said, I'm one of four siblings and, m m you know, my brother definitely helped me with a lot of factual questions. Um, and, and I just, uh, something I do a lot of times if I write a book, I'll, I'll ask someone who has familiarity with certain topics to like read it in its entirety 
Um, and ho hopefully like I exp express my gratitude or, you know, like <laughs> give a present to this person or something, or in some cases I've offered to pay people, but, um, uh, although not my brother, he's, he needs to do it for free just cause he's my, my brother. And just, yeah. just to kind of almost say like this detail, like smells false or whatever. And then, so, but and meanwhile, I mean, one of my sisters actually works in Washington DC. She's an environmental lobbyist, the good kind of environmental <laughs> lobbyist. Um, and so she gave me factual feedback, but my two sisters, one is older and one is younger. And one of them reads a lot of um, like essay collections by female celebrities, especially comedians. And one of them is very smart and like reads the newspaper and, and does, reads maybe one or two novels a year. And so in some ways they are a good gauge of like, like normal people you know like it's like it's if somebody's an avid reader and they say i read rodham in 24 hours you know um it's sort of like i, I i'm delighted but i kind of interpret that in the context of like maybe they read you know three books a week in 24 hours but if my sisters say i read it in 24 hours or like this was riveting but this was boring like i i take it very seriously because i know i know there's all different kinds of readers and there are some readers who say like this is the one book I'm going to read for my vacation or for my summer or whatever. So, so I do, I feel like they are very supportive. And I mean, they also, um, it can be, you know, like, I think, <laughs> I think your own family never takes you that seriously, which I think can also be, be kind of healthy and refreshing. So that's the answer to that question. Wait, and now I've already lost track. What was this? Um, well, it was really because having been in that supported, oh. environment, how does it feel then to have it out in the world? And, and because it is, your subject is someone that everybody wants to talk about. So yeah. how does it I'm, feel? To put, are you proud of it? Are you happy? Are you... Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's interesting, like the fact of it coming out during this pandemic, I mean, it's, it certainly does like a pandemic does put a sort of mediocre book review in perspective where, where it sort of feels like what, you know, and I, I've always felt really lucky to be a writer. I feel extra lucky now. Like I feel very supported by, you know, my publishers in the UK and the US. And, and that's something that I never take for granted. And I, I of course, um, like it's really, you know, sometimes like on Twitter, someone will reach out, like even yesterday, someone, like a, a several people said, they would say like, I wanted to ration the book, but then I read the whole thing or like I finished it at 2.45 AM. And, and it's really, it's nice because I, I feel, I mean, like I can make donations to, um, you know, like a food bank or something. And I do, but, but I feel like the thing that I specifically can do in the world is like write a book and tell a story. And so it is like a very special feeling to think someone received this, like someone accepted this on the terms, you know, that I intended them to. And, they found this like gripping and thought provoking and maybe cathartic. And even like there's a, um, like a, a female law professor reached out and said like uh, on social media and, and said she like teared up reading this thing. It's like a reference to legislation and it's like a fleeting sentence. And, and I actually, I have two good friends who are female law professors and I asked them many, many questions to try to get things right. And, and she said, oh yeah, it was all totally right. Like the stuff with the syllabus and the stuff with like the outfits and the stuff with, um, and so it, it does, it feels like incredibly lucky and, and nice to, if I, if I work really hard and make a big effort and then people read it and they're like, I loved it. I could tell that you worked really hard. I could tell that you, I mean, it's very nice to be recognized for your efforts and to feel like you can bring pleasure to people. So I, I would say, I mean, you know, there's, there's certainly mixed reception for the, for the book and there's people, you know, there's some, some people making fun of it and, you know, but it's like, mm. <laughs> oh, well. Yeah. There are also some really beautiful, thoughtful and articulate reviews out there as well. And, and, you know, the conversations that you're having with people about it are super interesting. So Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you, Mary. Thank you so much for your question. This is this is my my best crack of dawn interview ever. <laughs>
<laughs> Yay, the first and the best. <laughs> I mean, it would be a wonderful interview anyway, but it's, it's definitely the, the best one that I've woken, the, the one, I've never done an interview where I've eaten no food. In, oh. like, I have coffee, I have coffee. I was too, oh, I was, goodness. you know, it's, yeah, it's I know. okay. I, I, it was a small price to pay. Um, thank you so much. This was wonderful. I really appreciate oh, it. That's a pleasure. Hang with us for two seconds. Um, I just want to remind everybody the book is Rodham and it is available in your local bookstore now, which is where we would <laughs> where we would absolutely love you to go and find it. And I just want to remind people that uh, next week, next Wednesday, I'll be talking to Polly Sampson, who's the author of uh, Theatre for Dreamers. Um, Curtis, congratulations. It is a fantastic book, a great read. I can completely understand why people are mowing through it in 24 hours. Um, and it's been such an honour to talk to you today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. See you later.